Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. If your name's written in the book of the Lamb of Christ, that means you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you will go to be with him for all eternity. If your name is not written in that book, you will not. Very simple. Matter of fact, I got to take you to that passage in Revelation because this is important. Revelation 21. It tells it right here, explains it here. I'm not going to explain the whole passage because it's too detailed, but I'm going to give you, a, I'm going to whet your appetite. This happens, this judgment takes place at the end of the millennial kingdom right before eternity starts. Okay, it is the final judgment that takes place. It's a judgment against all unbelievers at all time, forever. Revelation 20, verse 11, it says, I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it. That's Jesus, because God gives Jesus authority to judge in John 5. Uh, Whose presence earth and heaven had fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. So you have books open and then you have another book open. The many books and then the book of life. It says, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. So the dead are going to be judged on their deeds, the things that they've done in this world. But remember, there's this other book over here. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, meaning the physical bodies idea here, and death and Hades, Hades being the spiritual place where they are now, gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds, according to the things that were written in the books. They were judged on them, okay? And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. That's Gehenna, that's the eternal hell. Five hells mentioned in scripture, Gehenna is the final one. The other ones, three of them are for um, demons, and then two, Hades is temporary, and then you have the eternal hell. This is the second death, the lake of fire. What's the first death? Physical death. The second death is a spiritual death. That's called the lake of fire. Verse 15. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So he's judged on the books, the deeds, but he throws it into the lake of fire. He goes to eternal hell because his name was not written in the book of life of the Lamb. Good question. Oh, man, these are <laughs> lengthy answers. Why would people who are not believers need to be judged? Okay, let me ask you a question. Why are people who are believers judged? Why do we get judged? What do we get when we go to judgment? Crowns. We get crowns for the deeds that we have done according to the works that we've done. According to 2 Corinthians 5.10. What are we going to do with those crowns? Put them at the feet of Jesus. But what else is going to happen with those crowns? They're gonna, we're going to have positions in heaven. We're going to have responsibilities in heaven. And it's going to be relegated from those crowns that we receive. Way too long of a discussion for tonight. Another time. I believe that the people are judged according to their deeds, and they're going to have positions in hell based on what they did. Yeah, as Sue says it all, she goes, ooh. So um, I believe that, and I, I can't get into it tonight, but the parables in Matthew 25 deal with the idea of, of placement of positions. And if there's placements and positions in heaven, and we're judged and we receive that because of that, then it makes sense that the same thing would happen in Hades. What was 2 Corinthians 5.10? It talks about the judgment seat of Christ. That's the judgment seat for believers. This in Revelation 20 is the judgment seat for unbelievers. But... What hope we have that you and I, if we believe in Jesus Christ, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life and nobody can ever erase them. When the Bible talks about your name being erased from the book, it's talking about the book of the living. That's different from the book of the Lamb. I can never be erased. Once we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, according to Ephesians 1.13, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise and we can never be erased from God's, work, from God's book and we were promised eternity with him. That is something to hope for. So even though the Jews are going to go through all this, if their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they will be rescued. Praise the Lord. 
you and I will be too. No matter what we have to go through on this earth, our 70, 80, 90 years here, nothing compared to eternity. Everything we do here is building towards our eternity with God. Everything we do for his service is going to have rewards in heaven. Now, let's, I've done lots of things in his service that I did in my own motivation. Those are going to be burned up. Those, those don't get rewards because they were doing them on my motivation. When we do God's work for God's purpose, that's what gets its reward. Whole different subject, but you've got to understand the importance of having your name in the book of life. Only God knows whose name's there. Unless you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ. And then the Bible says you can know. In 1 John 5, 13, it says, uh, because people will say you're arrogant, saying that you know you're going to heaven. Well, no, I'm not. I'm just quoting scripture. 1 John 5, 13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know you have eternal life. I can know I have eternal life because I have believed and committed my life to Jesus Christ. Have you? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? If so, you will have eternal life. You'll be rescued like them. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but the others to what? Disgrace and everlasting contempt. What does that tell you? What does verse 2 tell you? What's going to happen to everybody? Judgment. Everybody will be judged. What else? All of us that will have a certain place to go, that's right, either, either heaven or hell, are going to be... Okay, everybody's going to be resurrected. There's no soul sleep. Everybody's going to be resurrected. That's what it says. Many of those who sleep in the dust of ground will awake. But there's two places you're going to go. John 5, verses 28 and 29 say, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb shall hear his voice. This is Jesus talking. And shall come forth. All who are in the tomb shall come forth. That's resurrection. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life. Those who did, committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Now remember, we're judged on our deeds. We're judged on the books. But we go to heaven or hell based on if our name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. Everybody's going to be resurrected. Everybody's going to go through judgment. Some, the good, are going to go to a resurrection of life. And the evil to a resurrection of judgment. Okay, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. Her question is, what about Jesus in the three days that he was dead, in, in the ground, so to speak? What did he do? And I'm just going to give you this quick answer. I'm not going to explain it. In 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, start with verse 18. It says, Christ also died for sins, once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. That's why he died, to bring us to God. Having been put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. All right, he's in the spirit now as we go into the next verse. In which also he went. So when he's in the spirit, he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. So the, I told you there are three hells that are for the demons. This is one of them. It's called Tataru in the scripture. And it says here that Jesus went and made proclamation when he was in the spirit indicating it was during that three days while he was in the grave. He went and made proclamation to them of who he was. Now, he didn't give them a second chance. The word proclamation in the Greek there says he went and proclaimed that he's the Messiah. He didn't give them a second chance to accept him and go to heaven. He just proclaimed to them. He spoke forth the truth of who he was to them. That's what he did to them. No second chances once you're dead. Those are demons anyway, so it's a different ballgame, but... No, this is only demons. Only demons. Right, that we're talking about in Tartaru. All right, let's continue on now. This gives us the hope. They, are, they, have, they have hope that the name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They have hope that there's going to be a, a, a resurrection and they're going to be part of it. Verse 3 says, Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. We've talked about those who have insight before. Who are those people? Those who follow God. We talked in chapter 11 uh, earlier about that when they were fighting Antiochus Epiphanes. Those who had insight fought him. Those who knew God and his word fought him. So those who have insight will shine brightly. In other words, they'll go to heaven. 
And those who lead the way, those who lead the many to righteousness, like, to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. What an encouragement to be doing the right thing, to know the Lord and be doing the right thing for him. According to this, specifically speaking, according to the context, this is talking about Israel at the end times. But the idea goes for us too. We will shine brightly if, we're, if we know God and we're doing his will. And uh, if we lead many to righteousness, we're going to be like the stars shining in the heavens. Pretty exciting. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Why would he give him 12 chapters and tell him to conceal it? People wouldn't understand it. People don't understand it now when we're living through it and we know the history of it. They couldn't understand it then, so God says, seal it up. There's coming a time when people won't understand it because he says, many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Now, there's a couple of explanations for this. Many will go back and forth. Some people say that's travel. But really, that doesn't fit the context here. For years, I thought it was travel because that's what people said, and I thought, okay, that fits with the end times. But it doesn't fit the context. What is, who cares if people are traveling? If, they're, if he's concealing the book, and the next part is that they're going back and forth, what are they going back and forth for? Yeah, to understand the scriptures and the prophets and what's happening in these last days, because that's the time he mentions there is the end times. Somebody have their hand up back here? Okay, the same thing. So that makes much more sense than travel does. But even if it is travel, are we seeing expansive travel in these last days? Uh, like never before. And then knowledge will increase. Well, I've got this whole great list of amazing how knowledge has increased. This list I wrote in 2010. And I thought, I better double check these figures now because it's 2015. Oh my gosh, everything's tripled and quadrupled since 2010. Knowledge is increasing so fast, but that doesn't go with the context. Who cares if knowledge increases? What does the context indicate? Knowledge about what will increase? Prophecy. As we understand the rest of Scripture. See, nobody had the whole Bible until the 1400s to even study all of Scripture. Now we do. We can study it. We can understand it. And boy, living in this day and age, we can really see it because we see that what the Bible says and we see the current events coming to life. Uh, earlier today, we were looking at a chart in the back by Clarence Larkin, who has written some amazing books. One is The Dispensational Truths, and he's got these amazing charts that will just knock your socks off. This man wrote was right on in everything he talked about prophecy, and he wrote the books in 1917, a hundred years before today, and he was right on, even prophesying, even saying that Israel would become a nation because he knew what the Bible said. You see, as we get near the end times, the Holy Spirit's going to give us wisdom and people are going to be going to and fro searching for the truth and the knowledge of the end times is going to increase. That's why the book was sealed, but now is open so that we can understand it. The Amplified Bible reads in that particular verse, but you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Then many shall run to and fro and search anxiously throughout the book and knowledge of God's purposes as revealed by his prophets shall be increased and shall become great. That's the Amplified Bible. So they obviously amplify this to give what they believe it means. But that makes perfect sense to me. Are we in this day and age? Yes, we are. But as for you, let's see, verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked to behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the river and the other on the other bank of the river. What river are we talking about? When did we last see somebody standing on the bank of the river? Chapter 10. When all of this last prophecy started, walking through the battles of the north and the south, uh, well, first of all, the spiritual battles, then the battles between the north and the south, bringing us up to the Antichrist in these end times, that's when it started, was chapter 10. So now Daniel's kind of going back, telling us this is all happening in the same vision, dream, understanding of chapters 10, 11, and 12. Because now Daniel looks, and there were two others standing on the bank of the river. Then I, Daniel, looked to behold. Two others were standing, one on this bank of the river and the other on the other bank of the river. And one said to the man dressed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? Okay, who's the man dressed in linen? 
Based on our study earlier of chapter 10. Jesus. Okay. It doesn't tell us, but we are assuming from the context it's described as Jesus was in Revelation, so we assume so. And then he, so the two angels asked Jesus, how long is it going to be until the end of these wonders? Hmm. In other words, when, the, when is the end of time going to happen? Now remember, Daniel, this is happening in, what, 569 B.C.? No, 539 B.C. So this is a long time ago, 2,500 years, and he's asking when's the end going to be? Nothing has changed. In Matthew chapter 24, the disciples said to Jesus, when will the end be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? People want to know when Jesus is coming. They want to know the first coming. We want to know the second coming. And yet, how many people are willing to look for that, to go to and fro? You are. Praise the Lord. I hope other people will be too. How long will it be to the end? Verse 7. I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river. As he raised his right hand and his left hand towards heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. How many years is that? Three and a half years. Time is one year, times is two years, half a time is a half year. You add them together, three and a half years. We seen that before? Yes, first half of the tribulation is three and a half years, second half is three and a half years. So, what he's saying is here, how long will it be until the end of these wonders? After you've seen the wonders that you've seen, when, you've, when you see the Antichrist, that you saw in those previous verses in chapter 11, and then it's three and a half years until the end. Once Satan empowers, indwells, whatever words you want to use to the Antichrist, those last three and a half years, he's saying, that once you see that, it's going to be three and a half years until the end. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. So there's coming a time when Israel is going to be really dealing with a lot of major issues when the Antichrist declares himself to be king in Israel. Safe place to go now? I'd go there rather than most cities in the United States. But there is coming a time. If we're still here, I don't believe we will be, but if we are, there's coming a time where you will not want to be in Israel because this is going to happen and it's going to be hell on earth for them. Verses 8 to 10. As for me, I heard but could not understand. Well, duh, that makes sense. How many of you understood this book before we studied it? And we're living through some of these times and we've got history. Makes sense he couldn't understand it. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? He said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until when? The end times. Until the end times. What does that tell you? In the end times, they're going, to be conce they're going to be revealed. We're going to be able to understand them. We're seeing them today. Now, do we know who the Antichrist is today? No, we don't. He may be alive. He may be on the earth. He may be anybody. We don't know that, but we do see these. The opportunity for all these things are coming to play so that we can understand we are very close. Verse 10. Many will be purged, purified, and refined. We saw that earlier when there was a war between the Jews and Antiochus Epiphanes. So those people who believe in God are going to be purged, purified, and refined. Now, textually, this is talking about Israel. But it also deals with the Gentiles because they're going to be going along with this too. So uh, unbelievers aren't going to have a problem, at least not until they die. So this is talking about believers who are going to go through a lot of major persecution. And folks, I'm here to tell you, it started here in the United States. I mean, it started a while ago, but it is, on, on June 26th, the um, gauntlet was thrown down and the persecution of Christians is going to be like you've never seen it before. You've got to be able to stand up for Christ, even if it's cost you your job. Many, it says, will be pure, pur purified and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. That's the Antichrist and all of his people. And none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. Why will the wicked not understand? Yeah, we read it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. God's going to send them a deluding influence because they've turned away from God. That sounds cruel of God. They turned away from him before he ever did that. Daniel 12, 11 through 13. 
From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there's going to be 1,290 days. That sound familiar? No. We're used to 1,260 days. This is 1,290 days. He's saying that instead of the, the last part of the tribulation is three and a half years, 1,260 days. This says there's another 30 days. So by the time you have the, the sacrifices abolished, Daniel 9, 27, and the abomination of desolation is set up, that's 2 Thessalonians 2 that we talked about, from that time until the end, there's 30 days added on to it. You've got 1,260 days, now you've got an extra 30 days. Then it says, how blessed is he who wait, keeps waiting and tasteth 1,335 days. Wait a minute, that's 75 days after the three and a half years. But as, I'll get to that in a minute and I'll explain it. But as for you, Daniel, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at when? The end of the age. What is that promise, Daniel? Eternal life. Resurrection with God to have eternal life with him. So Daniel, don't be worried about what I've given you. After all, anyway, you're 81 years old at this point. Don't worry about it. You're going to go your way. You've been faithful. You're going to go to the end, rest. And then when the end comes, you're going to be resurrected. Wow. That's a great testimony for a great man. Is that what God's going to say about you? Let's go back to this interval now of 75-day interval. You've got the tribulation period that's broken down into two, three-and-a-half-year periods. It's believed by many. We don't know because there really aren't any cross-references that tell us this is exactly what these days are going to be used for. But we do know from Scripture that after Jesus returns, there will be judgments. Judgments are required of the Jews, of the nations, of the angels, though that will probably be later. But there will be judgments. We also know that for a temple to be built, or in, in this case, rebuilt, it has to be built for a millennial temple because Christ will reign in his, in his temple. We believe Ezekiel 40 to 46 is the explanation of the millennial king, temple. Before that temple can be built, the temple mount has to be purified. In order for that to happen, you have to have the ashes of a red heifer. And you can read about it in Numbers 19. That uh, is, he's been, He hasn't been yoked. He's a couple years old and he's sacrificed and then his ashes are mixed with water and that purifies anything unclean. So you've got some things to do. From the time that Christ returns until the millennial kingdom starts, there's stuff to do. Now, the world has changed a little bit. The mountains have come down, according to Zechariah 14. And, you know, but it's the same world, the same air we breathe, the same atmosphere, the same land. Everything's the same, pretty much. Uh, so even though Jesus can go, when it's all done, it's still people that are going to be living in human bodies, doing human things. Obviously, we who come back are going to be in spiritual bodies, but there are going to be people living on earth living a human life. So they will do things in human terms in human days. It will take time for the judgment. It will take time for the purification of the temple. So whether the uh, 30 days or the cleansing of the temple or the judgment of the nations, if they're flip-flopped or whatever, that gives us a possibility of what will happen those 75 days before then the millennial kingdom starts, before the much prophesied reign of Jesus Christ here on earth. Wow, is this detailed or what? Why does God give us so much information, so much detail? What? For hope. So we can know what's going to happen, so we can know what's going to happen to us. Not just head knowledge of what's going to happen, but a heart knowledge of what's going to happen to us. So as we end this book of Daniel, I can't end without asking you, are you, is your name going to be written in the Lamb's book of life? You're the only one that can make that decision. I can't make it for you. Your parents didn't make it for you when they brought you into church. Nobody can tell you what to do. It's a personal decision between you and God. No magic prayer, however. Acts 2, at the end of Acts 2, has a pretty good prayer by Peter that pretty well says the same thing. Simply repent, believe, understanding you're a sinner. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Understanding that you need a redeemer. Well, first of all, that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
And then Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess Jesus, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus says, Lord, Master, Savior, Kurios, King, the one that you are willing to follow. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's simply an act of surrender, a heartfelt faith surrender. That's how your name gets written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Is it going to be there? I pray it is. Let's pray. Father, this book is amazing. As we see you, as we see you detail everything that's going to be happening in these time periods in such amazing explanation, ways that we could never understand or couldn't understand. It's hard for us to understand unless we really understand you and the rest of Scripture that ties in together to give us an understanding. But we are clearly understanding. We do have that knowledge because I believe we're in the last days. Everything points to it. Fulfilled prophecies, timing, so many things point to it that we're there. Even the most despicable men on the face of the earth over the last hundred years have, have been alive over the last hundred years because I think Satan's getting ready, picking out his men that he can use in any generation in case that's the last generation. God, I pray for everyone in this room that everyone here knows for certain that their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if they don't know, that they'll pray right now because they want to be with you in heaven for all eternity. They want to be resurrected to life, not resurrected to judgment. It's simply an act of faith and surrender by admitting that we're a sinner. God, I admit I'm a sinner, that I can't get to heaven apart from you. But through the blood of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross is God dying for my sins and then being raised from the death to be the first one to overcome death, the first one to be resurrected, to open the door of heaven for me so I can be resurrected. I believe in that. And I commit my life to follow Jesus with all my heart. I know when I did that 41 years ago, I wasn't quite sure what I was doing. I knew it was a commitment, but I didn't quite know what it means, and that's not important. What's important is you submit your life to surrender to Jesus Christ. So if you want to do that right now, just pray those words. And then, Jesus, if these people have committed themselves to you, you tell us that they are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You tell us that we can know that we have eternal life. We thank you for the hope of being rescued from this world. We thank you for the hope of Jesus Christ that he has given us through his death and resurrection. We thank you for eternity with you that is forthcoming no matter how long we're here on earth. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank. Living Word Ministries is a listener-supported program. Please tune in each week at the same time for Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank.